uh, yeah, thank you, thank you, Ewa, for uh, letting me come here and talk today, and thank everybody else for, for joining. And like she said, uh, I've written this book, uh, Convolutional Neural Networks with Swift for TensorFlow. I've uh, been working on it for about a year now. I uh, recently shipped it off to the publishers. It's not quite over the finish line, but uh, later this year you should be able to get your hands on a uh, copy. Uh, so I thought today I'd just sort of walk you all sort of the, through the sort of the primary sequence of the book, we'll say, just how I structured things, uh, and then sort of, you know, maybe look at some, some stuff I encountered along the way and maybe where, uh, some, some pain points that we might look at next. Uh, so at a high level, we'll sort of like look at the problem of uh, image recognition just as a single problem, uh, but through the lens of Swift for TensorFlow. Uh, towards that end, we'll sort of look at neural networks and convolutions and how they can be used together to solve this problem. Uh, from there, we'll look at some simpler versions like MNIST and CIFAR and how we can build upon sort of this base to tackle problems like VGG and ResNet, which are full-blown uh, ImageNet level image recognition networks. And then we can sort of start to look at like the uh, mobile net family of networks and the research that leads up to uh, efficient net, which is pretty close to the current state of the art in this field. Uh, so here we go. For that though, I thought maybe I'd talk about like sort of what was going through my head as I was trying to do all this. I have sort of this weird uh, intersection of these areas of techniques. Uh, I was at WWDC whenever they announced Swift a while back. I remember there was kind of like this weird energy in the air. Everybody knew that something had changed, but nobody quite knew what had happened. Uh, I didn't actually start doing Swift right then, uh, but I think later on that year we had an app where we wanted to have uh, extensions in it. And so uh, as a result, we moved to the new version of iOS. And so then I like snuck my first Swift file into the project. Uh, and then since then, uh, I've been doing it pretty regularly. Uh, I've done a lot of Unix and stuff like that. Uh, I used to maintain an open, help maintain an open source project called Homebrew, so some of you may have used that. Uh, I think normal people see like a wall of shell scripts and uh, they run away, whereas for me, I'm like, oh good, you know, here's something that I can uh, play with and get working on my own. Uh, and then I've been really interested in this whole field of deep learning in general. Uh, I studied a little bit of AI in school, but it was mostly like uh, you know, traditional techniques, we'll say, like Markov models and uh, SAT solvers and things like that. And so uh, this whole deep learning thing, I've kind of had to like, uh, you know, re re rebuild my understanding of things from the foundations. Uh, towards that end, I've kind of like gone through a lot of the online courses out there and I think very much I've tried to have like a, a beginner mindset. Uh, there, there's a lot of things in uh, writing this book where I thought I knew what I was talking about, but whenever you try to like convert it into words, you start to realize that you're, you know, it, it's not quite as clear as you actually thought it was. And so I think that's a, you know, important way to always be asking why. Uh, the second level of this, I think then is the uh, Swift for TensorFlow project itself. I love this idea that we're sort of like rethinking how all this stuff works together, the foundations and everything like that. Uh, you know, people say, you know, X framework is the future, and it's like, well, no, you know, this field's barely even a few years old, and I think it's way, way, way early to be predicting, you know, where things are going to be at even in a decade from now. Uh, a lot of technical books I found kind of take like what I would call like a, a shotgun approach. You know, they sort of like do a GAN or do an RNN network and maybe a convolutional neural network and then voila, you suddenly understand uh, neural networks somehow. Uh, that's, that's not really the style that I've had much luck with. So I just like to really understand one problem and understand it well. And so towards that end, I, I, like I said, I just took this image recognition problem and tried to go about it deep, as deep on it as is possible. Uh, one of the cool things, well, in general, I think, you know, in deep learning or even in other fields, uh, being able to, like, you know, play with things, dabble with it, cheap experiments, 
I, that to me is like, you know, the process by which you gain mastery, you know, by continually messing with things and understanding how they actually work together. So the cool thing to me about uh, computer vision in particular and image recognition, I think, is that you don't really actually have to have a fancy computer to do it. You don't really have to have, you know, everything working 100% in order to be able to, be able to play with these things. So even though like Swift for TensorFlow is still, you know, in a, a zero point X release, we'll say, I, I still, you know, for what I was trying to do, I, I thought it was more than sufficient and, and solved all my problems there. Uh, and then the other thing I feel like I found is that uh, convolutional neural networks in general are kind of like a really good foundational technique. People will like learn them quickly and then try to jump off to other things. But I, I found that the more and more I've studied convolutional neural networks, all of a sudden other techniques start to become much more uh, easy for me to understand, uh, like reinforcement learning or NLP or things like that. So I think it's like a really good spot for people to get started. So these are sort of the four traditional areas of computer vision. We're just going to focus on image recognition, which is basically just deciding if something is a cat or a dog picture. Uh, I've used this slide a whole bunch in a bunch of my presentations, but I, I really think there's a lot that can be unpacked here. Uh, perceptrons are like from the 1950s or so. Neural networks are not really as new as many people think. Uh, but basically they found that like trying to literally go from an input to an output uh, it didn't really work because the data is too complicated. So then they added sort of this layer of indirection, this layer of hidden nodes, which is how you make dense networks, feed forward networks. And then if one layer of indirection is good, then two layers of indirection is better. And so you have sort of this deep feed forward pattern of sort of an input, two layers of uh, 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 dense nodes, and then an output. But I find like this pattern, you'll see it a lot. Like in NLP, oftentimes there'll be an input, two layers of LSTM modules, and then an output. And so I think this basic pattern is a good one to know. And then from there, basically we can just add convolutions on the neck on top, and then you have a full-blown uh, deep convolutional neural network. So look at this deep feed forward and then this deep convolutional neural network, because that's literally what we're going to do next. Uh, we can take the MNIST problem, which is just a very simple uh, black and white data set. Uh, and we can take the data at each level and unroll it, just convert it into like a long string of numbers. But if we take this like this and we run it through two layers of densely connected nodes, we can actually make a really good uh, categorizer for our digits. From there, we can sort of get into convolutions. Uh, this is sort of like I think the best slide I've found for trying to explain convolutions to people. But we literally take our source data, this back set of pixels. For each group of three pic nine pixels, we add them all together, and then we output the result. And then we just simply step over the picture layer by layer until we have a new output image. You don't even really have to understand this at additive step, because that's what the uh, neural network is going to learn for us. And then the other trick we can throw on top is this max pooling step. But I think this is reasonably easy to understand as well. We just take a group of pixels, say these red pixels, pick the largest one out, and then send that one on to this new, new layer. So then we can go back to our MNIST problem and revisit it using convolutions. Uh, so now we just simply take our input, run it through two layers of 3x3 three three convolutions, a max pool, then we have our same two densely connected layers, and then our output layer. So now we've built ourselves a very simple convolutional neural network for, to perform image recognition. The thing is, if, if you've made it this far, I actually think that's actually the hardest part of actually understanding this field. Uh, CIFAR is a slightly larger data set, but it's composed of real world pictures of animals and vehicles, but we can solve it or, or tackle it using just a slightly larger version of the network that we just looked at before. So now we have two layers, the three by three nodes, max pool, two layers, the three by three nodes, a max pool, and then our same densely connected layers 
to do an output. Uh, this isn't like a you know a state of the art approach, but conceptually it works, right? Uh, from there though, literally we can just start to build bigger and bigger networks. So this is the VGG network, but it's literally no more complicated than the things that we've looked at before. We've just added more and more layers of these three by three convolutions and max pools. Uh, I did the VGG 13, which has like three nodes, but I actually like this VGG 19 because then we can sort of start to go to the next level of thinking of each layer as perhaps being a set of layers. So we might have one set of two three by three nodes, another set of two to three by three nodes, two sets of two sets of three by three nodes. The power of this approach then is we can jump up to like a network like uh, ResNet. Uh, but the, the backbone of the ResNet network is nothing more than sets of uh, three by three convolutions, the same as the techniques I've shown you before. Uh, we, we put three layers, four, six, and three down the side. Uh, and then the other trick that the residual networks add is this idea of skip connections going in between the layers. And then finally, uh, we have to go away from the three by three nodes. So if you look over here at our left, we sort of replace our two three by three nodes with this one by one, three by three, one by one approach and uh, replace all the nodes in our network like this. And that produces ResNet 50, which is a really, really important network for people to know. So everything I've shown you so far is like the first six chapters of the book or so, we'll say. Just sort of trying to get people up to speed with this technique. After that, we start to look at like uh, mobile networks, sort of trying to, to do more things more efficiently with our data, which in gen ultimately will allow us to produce even better networks. So I did a talk like three years ago on mobile net v1. If you're interested in that, you might look at that. Uh, the key concept of Mobile net is this idea of this sort of depth-wise combined with point-wise convolutions. Um, it's kind of a tricky concept to explain, but the basic idea is that we can sort of, since we're doing these sets of operations on layers, we can kind of group them together in order to make them run faster, and by extension, run them on a mobile device. Uh, this is a Medium article I found that I thought was really a good explanation of what's going on, so you might check out that there. I did talk a couple years ago. I talked about MobileNet v2, but I didn't really break down how it worked. Uh, but basically, it builds on the MobileNet v1 architecture, but adds this concept of linear activations and uh, inverted bottleneck layers. I think the linear activations piece is actually pretty easy to understand. Uh, basically, they discovered that uh, they were running the network through a ReLU at the last spot, and it didn't actually need to be done that way. So they simply deleted that ReLU and that's, what's, that's what they're calling is a, a linear activation. Uh, the inverted bottleneck layers are a little bit harder to explain, but basically the ResNet we were looking at before, we sort of go from the top of the layer to the bottom. Uh, this network sort of goes from the right below the top to above the bottom. Uh, this, this has the side effect that maybe a little bit less data goes to the network, uh, but the flip side then is that it's a little bit more computationally cheap and so we can add some more layers. And so as a result, uh, this MobileNet v2 architecture can actually produce even better results than our MobileNet v1 just by slightly tweaking how we're putting the layers together. Uh, once again, here's a really nice blog post on this subject if you're interested more in that. Uh, so then, yeah, in the talk I did two years ago, I talked about MNASNet and how I thought that these sort of evolutionary strategies we're going to become more prevalent in the future. Uh, but I, I don't, you know, even I kind of underestimated that, we'll say. Uh, so what's wild to me is that this slide here is combining MNASNet uh, with MobileNet v2. Uh, but the most important part of the MNASNet paper turned out to be the uh, search strategy they were using to find these networks. So they literally took MNASNet and uh, used the MobileNet v2 blocks together, and then threw in some concepts from the SE Net paper, which also came out a couple of years ago. And with these three concepts together, uh, they were able to produce efficient net, which is in my eyes the current uh, state of the art in this field. But conceptually, what we do is we just take a baseline network, 
that we know works. And then we can give the computer a whole bunch of variants that are either wider, deeper, or uh, thicker. I, I don't know a better way, but you know, higher resolution, we'll say. And then we can let the computer sort of search over all this uh, search space of these different uh, network pieces in order to find the most optimal set uh, that all work together. Uh, so this is a really important paper to understand that came out last year. Uh, and then from there we can kind of like go back down to another mobile network. Uh, the, the core mobile net v3, uh, basically there was some stuff in the efficient net that wasn't as uh, used a bit too much memory and processing time to actually be doable on a mobile device. So they sort of add simplified versions of that. Uh, but the, the core part of mobile net is very much just efficient net with a even more constrained uh, search space. Uh, I thought this part, uh, this is the output logic of mobile net v3. I thought this was interesting. Uh, basically they took this uh, original last stage up here which is kind of like more of the mobile net v2 style approach we might say uh, but they found that this simplified set of one by one convolutions was able to produce uh, extremely good results and it's also extremely uh, performant. So what's cool then about this network is we have this like super tiny super fast network and then we can start to uh, use it to build other things. So this is another slide from the paper here at the bottom where they sort of took the mobile net v3 as a base and then they added a full-blown segmentation network and head on top uh, in order to produce a state-of-the-art uh, segmentation network that can actually be run on phones. Uh, and then, yeah, from there you can kind of get into full-blown state-of-the-art approaches. Uh, algorithms are nice, uh, but at the end of the day it's also really good to have lots of data. So this Facebook uh, paper from last year where they took like a billion images from Instagram and used that to build like a really large image recognition network is an interesting paper for you to look at. Uh, we can go from big data, we'll say, into uh, data augmentation strategies. Uh, so this RAND augment paper from last fall where they use basically uh, evol evolutionary strategies to find an optimal set of uh, augmentations is a really interesting paper. Basically by uh, adding processing layers to their data, they were able to produce the accuracy of their networks by 4 or 5% just by tweaking the data that went in. Uh, I didn't talk much about object detection networks, uh, but conceptually we can take an efficient net and put a uh, object detection head on top of it and voila we've produced a state-of-the-art object detection network. So this is another effi efficient that is an interesting paper to look at as well. Um, and then over in the field of NLP model distillation is an interesting technique to try and make big networks small. Uh, but this noisy teacher was a really interesting paper where they used a whole bunch of uh, TPU time in order to make small networks large. So they were able to tr train even larger versions of efficient net uh, just by using this sort of uh, uh, strategy. So I thought that was a really interesting paper to look at as well. Anyway, that, that's most of what uh, the primary sequence in my book is. Um, that's kind of like how I structured it. So I, I hope this all conceptually sort of makes sense to you. Um, I'd like to thank these people at APRESS for helping guide me through the process. Uh, this friend of mine named James Mackey like read an early version of the thing and gave me a bunch of feedback on uh, tone and how I was structuring things. So I wanted to say thank you to him. Uh, I had some questions about TPUs and Brennan answered those. So thank you to Brennan. Uh, and then yeah, thank, say thank you to my parents and uh, Corkworks, uh, my company for keeping the lights on, so to speak. Um, and then, yeah, at the risk of making a bad joke, I'd like to put a shout out to the uh, COVID virus for keeping me locked up for uh, a few months this year, which did wonders for my productivity. Uh, so yeah, last, uh, uh, last year I did a presentation with you all and I sort of had a wish list of some stuff I thought would be interesting to tackle next. Uh, checkpointing, uh, I wanted to say thank you to Brad for banging on that. 
I know that model serialization isn't uh, super fun, but it's a really important piece of plumbing, so it's cool that we have that now. Uh, I, I think this whole uh, TPU training piece is a really interesting way, you know, it is an interesting power of this whole Swiffer TensorFlow approach. This idea that you can sort of code something for a single TPU and then sort of run it on a pod to literally have thousands of uh, cores on demand is something that's really interesting. And I, I think that's, uh, you know, I, I think that's where we should be looking in the future. Uh, PyTorch has recently been working on adding uh, uh, mixed precision to their, to their libraries. And I, I think it would be interesting to think about the best way to add it to Swift for TensorFlow. Um, I think vFloat16 in particular as a data type is really interesting. Uh, I think part of the reason why people have not adopted TPUs as much as would be desired is that they don't have a way to run uh, TPU code locally to test it, to build and test it. And so with NVIDIA getting Amper to market here shortly, I think it'd be super interesting the idea that you can uh, build, say, bfloat16 code on your home workstation and then ship it off to the cloud to run there. And in theory, you know, numerical st stability and whatnot should all be the same. Um, Intel was supposedly going to ship Cooper's Lake this year, but I think that's been kind of backburnered. But um, in their next generation architecture out next year, uh, we'll be able to have bfloat16 hardware at the CPU level as well. And so I think this is a really interesting thing to try and uh, get, on, get on top of in the next uh, upcoming year. Uh, and then, in, in general, I think the existing data pipelines are, are work, work really well, but I think as you start to, uh, you know, say trying to scale something up to a TPU pod, I think that there's probably going to be a whole bunch of uh, pinch, uh, profiling and uh, optimization that can be done in order to improve the speed there. So I think it would be interesting to start thinking about the, the best way to get that piece going. Um, and then with that, I'll say thank you all for listening. Uh, thank you, Brett. Uh, there's some questions for you in the chat. I'm just going through them. Uh, Rex asked, are all the papers mentioned gone over in the book? Uh, 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 I mentioned most of them, uh, but I didn't implement them all. Uh, but I did implement the, uh, the the primary sequence of the mobile net networks and efficient net and uh, uh, VGG and uh, ResNet. Okay. Uh, here's a question from me. Uh, you've added like a number of models to Swift models, like VGG 16, 19, mobile net, efficient net, probably more. How was your experience adding this to Swift or TensorFlow and writing them in Swift versus Python? Also has, also has this question. And should we be adding, what other models do you think are missing from a Swift model suite talk? Uh, sure. Um, I was doing a lot of PyTorch a year ago, we'll say. And so, uh, whenever I initially started trying to write stuff for Swift, I was sort of trying to bring PyTorch uh, models and logic over. Uh, but basically, I found that I ran into a lot of uh, speed bumps there, where the you know the two networks would make subtly different assumptions about how things work, and then uh, you know things would break. Um, so somewhere like halfway through the year, I kind of switched to sort of working off Keras-based models. And uh, that made my life much, much simpler because even if Keras makes an assumption about how TensorFlow works, then Swift for TensorFlow by extension will oftentimes make the same assumptions. And so uh, after that, my life got a lot, lot easier. Um, as far as other networks that would be interesting to implement, um, the... Uh, there's some other, uh, I, don't, I don't know, there's, there's some other smaller networks that are kind of interesting. Uh, SENet would be kind of cool to sneak in there. Uh, but in general, I think the uh, 
thing that would be interesting to me would be to get an uh, ImageNet training demo working to where we could literally uh, be training these networks and sort of bootstrapping uh, the scaling process that way. Thank you. Alls has, um, has some nice complimentary words. Just can't wait to uh, receive the book once it's out. Uh, and he also said he hopes there'll be a GitHub repo with the models and Swift notebooks. That's your plan for the book? Uh, yeah, I have all the code together. I haven't published it, but uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, it's definitely on my list of to-dos. But uh, yeah, first we have to get the, the, the book out the door, so to speak. Uh, okay, uh, Brad answered your question about the mixed precision. He said that uh, mixed precision with Fox 16 is present under the hood in X10 right now, but we don't have automatic mixed precision for GPU yet. Um, so this is a comment. Uh, then also, again, uh, was kind of asking you to compare your experience writing in Python versus Swift. Uh, maybe you already answered that. But no, no. Uh, with respect to Python and Swift, um, I, I've done a lot of Python, and uh, I've done a decent amount of Swift at, at this point in time. Uh, to me, what's cool about using Swift is uh, you kind of get the type safety, and so it's made me willing to uh, make changes. Like making changes in Python code, you can change one line and basically, you know, you have to go through a whole bunch of steps and then something will crash. Whereas with Swift for TensorFlow, I'll oftentimes find myself sort of uh, changing things and sort of refactoring them slightly and then relying upon the compiler to sort of uh, throw errors and me fix things until finally the compiler's happy, at which point oftentimes I'm extremely confident the code's gonna work. You know, that making the compiler happy is the hard part, but that little bit of cost up front uh, is is way better than having the uncertainty about uh, you know some Python gremlin getting me because uh, you know I, I didn't do everything perfectly over there. Uh, some follow up questions to that. Speaking of type safety benefits with Swift, do you do your model de development in Xcode or, lin on, or on Linux? Um, I, I've been uh, doing everything with uh, Linux uh, eighteen oh four. Uh, CUDA 10.2, and then uh, I, I have uh, some NVIDIA GPUs. Um, it'd be cool to have uh, Ubuntu 2004, we'll say, but uh, I, I know that there's a whole bunch of stuff that has to happen uh, for that to happen. And then same thing, it'd be cool to have CUDA 11, but a whole bunch of stuff has to happen for that to happen as well. Uh, it's my understanding that's part of the TensorFlow uh, 2.4 roadmap, and so Hopefully, once that gets sorted upstream, uh, uh, Swift for TensorFlow can be brought into parity with that and then solve that problem. <laughs> uh, I, I mostly, uh, I, I don't know, I have a very uh, wacky workflow where I sort of uh, use Cyberduck to uh, open uh, files in TextMate, which is just an old Mac editor, probably some of you know. And, and so then I save stuff, it saves over the network, and then I have like a TMUX session and I, I hit run again over there. Uh, but every now and then things will get out of sync and uh, uh, it, it, your brain will hurt. Thanks. Uh, we have a couple questions from Rahul. Uh, he, he asked that will you be providing checkpoints of trade models somewhere? Uh, uh, no, most of my demos are just based around the ImageNet data set which uh, you, you can run locally in an hour or two on your home machine. So uh, uh, eventually, yeah, if we had a full-blown ImageNet proper data set, that would be an interesting thing to do, but I, I did not make checkpoints, no. And then also another question from Mahul. Uh, do you cover tasks like object detection and segmentation in your book? No, I, I, I only covered image recognition, and then I mentioned these other, like, you know, once you've built up to a state-of-the-art image recognition network, these other things are sort of ways to jump into other fields. Yeah. When will the books be released, Rex asked. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're, um, they're going to send me the proofs. Supposedly it was happen any day now. And then uh, 
I, I need to make a few tweaks and then I ship it back and then uh, hopefully maybe next month but you know cross fingers knocks on wood etc it'll it'll actually be out the door uh, Robin asked you uh, are there any particular resources you recommend for building Swift skills quickly please um, you can uh, load up the playgrounds in Xcode I think that's just kind of interesting to get this idea of having a, a full-blown repo working uh, but I, I think really um, I, I'm an iOS developer and I think like just doing like a very basic iOS app just sort of running some hello world tutorials over there is a really good way to kind of understand how the whole uh, uh, iOS uh, I don't know system works together and then I think a lot of these paradigms for Swift in general kind of come out of that uh, you know the NS uh, net the next step libraries and so if you can sort of structure things in a way that sort of matches that, that's a really good place to uh, really solid foundation for Swift in general. I was going to just say on swift.org you have like the, the program, you have Swift guides and there's a getting kind of started notebook that you can launch in Xcode uh, in Playgrounds and Playgrounds is like the interactive environment in Xcode that works for Swift. So that's a great place to get started as well. Yeah. Or running some of the our collab notebooks. Yeah, and then yeah. the the collab notebooks are really nice too because if you're a beginner, it really simplifies the uh, provisioning environment process way down. So you can just focus on uh, the the code code bits. Right. Uh, there are some more questions here. Some asking for a little more details about your Linux IDE that you're using. Are you using one? <laughs> Uh, using VS Code or Emacs or anything? Uh, like, like I said, TextMate on a Mac. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> or, or Nano, maybe. No, no, I, I do a little bit of VI every now and then, but uh, I'm, I'm by no means a, an expert, for sure. Uh, I personally use LODB, uh, which is a command line tool, not an IDE. Uh, I know some of people on our team also use VS Code. I don't know if anyone wants to speak to their experience with VS Code on this thread, each time up if you like. Um, but yeah, I think the tools on Linux could be improved for sure. <laughs> um, and then Brad asks, uh, Swift for TensorFlow evolves regularly. How does APRIS manage updates, Areta, if the syntax needs to be changed in examples? Have you found it difficult to keep up with changing uh, as with the changes as you're writing the book? Um. Yeah, I, I think that's an open problem. I'm not going to, uh, I mean, yeah, it's definitely going to evolve underneath it. Um, m most of my demos, I did them around the Epochs API, so it should be, you know, future-proof for the, the near future. Um, and then I think part of the idea of, yeah, maybe posting some code on the internet is I can sort of periodically update it to match whatever the latest uh, Swift or TensorFlow version is. Um, so hopefully, uh, yeah, I can mitigate that to some deal, but definitely that's going to be an issue. Okay. Uh, thank you. I mean, those are all the questions so far on the chat. Did anyone else have any questions they would like to bring up for Brad? Um, Brad, by the way, said he uses VS Code regularly, or is great as a remote editor via the SSH extension. And uh, Dave uses Emacs. Um, yeah, and that's so. Yeah, so I think that's it. And uh, one more question. Here we go. Oh. Rahul, do, do you explain transfer learning in your book? Uh, no, I didn't. I didn't do transfer learning either. Uh, just uh, building generic image recognition networks. Okay. Uh, well, thank you so much. I think uh, I can't wait to see the book. And um, yeah, and that's awesome. And let us know if there's anything we can do to help. Of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. At know. this yeah. point. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No. It's. It's. I think it's a cool project, and I enjoy banging around with it. And uh, I think uh, doing all this has kind of made me go back to the basics, or or whatever, so to speak. And so, I actually feel like it's dramatically improved my neural network knowledge in general. So messing with this for the past uh, year or so. And thank you for writing those models and contributing them to, to the project. Um, 
of that, I want to just open up the floor for any other general questions, if anyone has anything before we break. And I'll give it about 30 seconds. Thank you. 